good and so wonderful. He's so faithful. He's so in tune with every one of us. He's, he's just incredible. Let's honor the Lord. Let's give it up for the worship team. Angie Tackett and the, the youth worship team. It's beautiful. I want to read a quick scripture for you, then we're going to get right into things. This is just one scripture, but I've got a ton more to come, so just be ready for it. Hebrews 13 and 8 says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and honor you today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you how you were with us earlier today with the word and with your spirit, your move, those folks that got saved. Lord, thank you for being in the house tonight. God, we sense and know your presence is here. We just pray that you would make all the difference, Lord. Let the preacher step out of the way. God, let everybody's ears be wide open. and Let your word go forth. In the name of Jesus, we praise you and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. I want to share a, an idea. Let me try to put a picture in your mind. I saw a picture in the last couple of weeks. It's floated around just a few times, and I believe it's at a parade. It's just a quick snapshot of the audience at a parade. There, there's some folks standing right behind the barrier. If you can put in your mind, it's kind of like uh, the Queen of England is going by. It's, it's somebody important going by. And if you look into the audience, everybody in the audience is messing around with their phones. They're trying to get the right angle. Some people are holding their phone up, trying to get the right picture. Some people, you can see them, they're struggling to get their phone up to where they need it to be. And there's one lady right at the front of the audience, and she's an older lady, and she doesn't have a phone or anything in her hands, she's just resting on the barricade like this, with a big smile and a big amazement on her face, she might have her hand up like this, and she's just taking in everything that's happening, and the caption of the picture, it says, uh, it says, let me, let me write down here, I don't, I don't know if this is what it says exactly, but it says, Making a memory instead of capturing one. And I look at this, and this reflects our lives, I believe, in a lot of ways, because I feel like there's a lot of times that life is so busy and there's so much going on in our lives, it's kind of ironic, the things that make life more convenient, we haven't let it be more convenient, we've just allowed that to create some space that we can fill up with something else. So we spend our whole life being busy and, and captured by something there's not a whole lot of time, it seems like less and less is the time where we can just chill out, so to speak, and just, you know, watch the world go by. And we live in a, in a, in a, in a world where it's like that, and it kind of, you know, I'll go down to, uh, sometimes I'll cut down through the south, going somewhere, and I go by these houses of places where, you know, the houses don't look that great, and they, they're kind of run down, and they got a porch on the front. And there's somebody sitting on the porch, and they're just sitting there. And there's sometimes I'm like, man, it would be cool to live that life, you know, that's so, that's so simple. Can you imagine what it would be to live that simple? You know, when you're busy, you kind of think those things. There's a lot of distractions in our world, and this picture, you know, creates this beautiful, beautiful picture of how life is. But I want to share with you tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink of this water. Most of the time, nobody does, but I'm not passing it up. I feel better already. I want to look at this picture that I've described, though, and talk about us, the body of Christ. I think the enemy is always busy trying to come up with a distraction to keep us off of our game, to put us in a place where we're not focusing on what's most important and and keeping ourselves connected to what's right. The enemy's always bringing a distraction along to keep us off track. And they're different. They come in all different shapes and sizes. I wrote something down here. Hopefully I can go back to where it is. Distraction being a way to captivate our attention without us real, realizing it. Taking our attention from what matters most to something secondary. A distraction in the body of Christ. I believe the... The enemy tries to distract us in a million ways, and we could talk about a million of them. But I want to talk about something, one of the most precious gifts that we have that we probably, a lot of times, we don't ever think of. But if you look at it for what it is, you see the gift that it is. I think sometimes 
we try to look at the big picture, or we try to look at the big and glorious things, and sometimes we miss some of the most important gifts that we have. We have life. We've been given life. If you stop and think about it, you've been given life, so if you've been given life, that means you have purpose. And if you get given purpose, that means that you matter to other people. That means that you matter to God. That means that your purpose is supposed to play out in your life every day. And there's work that's supposed to be done. That means that God is a thinker, that he's a planner, that he works out things. You can take the simplest of ideas that maybe we'll gloss over and really get in contact with who God is. You woke up this morning because there was a plan, there was a purpose, there was a reason. We were given so many gifts and sometimes I think we're so distracted by looking for the big glorious things that we miss the most obvious ones right in front of us. I think one of the things that the enemy tries his best to do is to steal today. Today. This day that we have. He does his best to try to steal this day. He tries to fill our minds with busyness. Thoughts about, well, we have tomorrow. Well, didn't we have a good time last week? He fills us with all these things that keep us distracted from the importance and the gift of what today is that we have right now. And I want to talk about that. I feel like the body of Christ is being attacked and being distracted by what was and what may be. And, and I'm just going to talk about just a few little things. And we could say a million things about distractions, but I'm just going to hit a couple of things. The past, a lot of times, starts with these words. Well, I remember when. I remember when. I want to talk about remembering when. First thing I want to just talk about is guilt. Those who live in guilt, by, by, by your choice or by maybe even by somebody else, you live in guilt and it robs you of life. It makes you, it, to make yourself pay hurts you today and it hurts you tomorrow. It's a distraction. The funny thing is that while we live as sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Now let me stop it. Let me stop and, and kind of build on my thoughts here. Guild is this thing that we carry around with us over, over a choice that's been made in our past. And, and, and let's talk to a room full of Christians right now. If you're carrying guilt with you today, you're, there is no need for you to carry guilt. There is no reason for you to be still harboring something and carrying it around, still paying a price for something that's already been paid for. You're doing labor that's useless. You're punishing yourself and you're getting nothing out of it besides just hurting you. And the enemy wants to remind you of those things that are in the past. I got to take another drink of water already. He wants to remind you of those things in the past because he knows if he can get you distracted by what was in the past, it will rob today. It will rob you tomorrow. It will take away what you could be and where you should be going. He can have you all distracted and all busy thinking about something. And here, it's not even really an issue. It's been paid for. It's been taken care of. <coughs> Romans 8 and 33 says this, you shall, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We carry guilt, and it's already been taken care of. There's no reason for it. It's, the price has been paid. It's already been taken care of. God is already saying, you are mine. If you've called on him, he's already saying, you are mine. And you don't have to carry that. It's not being held. The only person that can really hold it against you is God, and he's saying, you don't have to. I'm not holding it against you. <coughs> we can't call ourselves guilty when we've been justified upon our confession with Christ. If, you're, if your guilt is still an issue with God, if your guilt was literally still an issue with God right now, then that means the blood of Christ is ineffective. But Romans 8 and 15 says this, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the power of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself breathes witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, 
if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together with him. Go back, Christian. I would, if you're going to go back to the past, go back to the cross where you confess Christ, where you lay down all your sins. There was never anything good about you necessarily to start out with, so lay it all at the foot of the cross once again. Guilt is the thing that can hold us back, a thing of the past that we need to lay down at the cross. The second thing I would like to talk about from the past is this. <clears throat> and this is a, a broad definition, but I want to talk about the good old days. The good old days were exactly as they're described. The good old days, whatever, whatever it was, whether it was when grandma used to, you know, uh, praise the Lord and hold hands and preach the gospel around your kitchen table, those were the good old days. When it was Harlem Park, when it was uh, the, other time, the other places here in town, Clayton Street, those were the good old days of our church. Those are the good old days of our walk with Christ, and it's beautiful. It's your heritage. It's my heritage. But there's a problem with going back there, so to speak. And it's not really the people. It's not really the places, the time. What it is is there's an issue there because sometimes life changes. The churches change. The personnel changes. People go on to glory. And the enemy can tiptoe in and say, well, it's not like it used to be. And, and in some respects, hey, it ain't like it used to be. Life changes. But I believe the enemy wants us to be stuck somewhere looking backwards and get so discouraged and feel so left out and feel so, you know, well, you know, it just ain't like it is used to be that we'll d get discouraged, that we'll kind of fold our hands and we'll kind of settle in and just be like, well, you know, it ain't like it used to be. But that's a lie from the enemy. He's turned beautiful, wonderful things that we've grown up in and our, our heritage and who we are. And he's turned those things to almost use against us. But I say this, that God has not changed. The uh, Hebrews 13 and 8, the scripture we read earlier, it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because time has went by, doesn't matter. Because the people change, it doesn't matter. Jesus is still the same as he was then. And if he was great, I'm telling you, he was great 25 years ago in a week when I got saved. When I come face to face with God, it was awesome and I got saved. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, it's 25 years later in a week. And I'm telling you, he's still great. He still is awesome right now as he has ever been. There is still promise. Amen. He's still awesome right now. So we don't need to throw in the towel and think, well, it was good back then and the days are over. I'm telling you, we haven't seen nothing yet. God is still God. God is still in charge. He's still incredible right now. And he can do amazing things and change every one of our lives. I can go back in my mind and I can throw you out some mile markers. Man, I had a great experience here. I had a great experience at this time. But I'm telling you, there is not one reason in this word that doesn't say I can't have the greatest experience with God that I've ever had right here and right now. I can have a mile marker moment in this second, and so can you. God can show up today in your life and do something incredible that will shape you forever. And I think that we should look like that. I think we should talk like that, expect like that, and look like that. Everywhere we go, we should have some good days. We should have some good old days. Let's stack some more good old days. Let's leave them in our wake every day that we go by because God's incredible every day. And he wants to do beautiful and wonderful things. God has not changed. Let your heart run wild. Believe, exercise your faith today and see God do something incredible. And not let the enemy take our heritage and say, well, that was then. The other thing we can get distracted about, and like I said, we could talk about this all night. Another thing we can get distracted by is tomorrow. We can forget about today because we're so busy thinking about tomorrow. And this is what I mean. Just a couple of things. Fear. It's a thing that captures our minds, that, that keeps us prisoner, that holds us back from going forward. Now think about it. It's potentially something that will never happen, but yet we can make real life decisions based on something that, who knows, it'll never happen. But we trust the possibility of it enough that it holds us back and we don't go for it. 
Our tomorrow is messing up our today. We say, what if? Or I can. It's not me. I'm sure you had those moments of where you try to step out. And fear comes along and says, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, I'm here to tell you that, like the song, fear is a liar. Fear is a liar. Psalm 119 says this. Brother Marty talked about it today and shared it. In there it says, there's a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. There are some sure things that I can step on that I do not need to fear. That I can say, you know what? Tomorrow might be crazy, but you know what? I know there's a God that's going to lead me through that. He's going to show me the word. He's going to speak to my heart. He's going to show me the path that I'm going to take so I can be who I need to be today. I can be on top of things for today and be who I'm supposed to be. 2 Corinthians says, in 2 and 14 says this. It says he always causes us to, causes us to triumph. Even if we have bad times to come, it doesn't matter because we're going to go forward and God is going to lead us into victory. Tomorrow, think about this, and this is just a goofy thing that I'm saying. Tomorrow is always, you know, tomorrow never comes. When we get to tomorrow, it's actually going to be today. Tomorrow is going to be the next day. It's kind of like this weird thought. Today is a day of what ifs. We walk in and sometimes we run in fear. <clears throat> a day of what ifs. There are some things that we think about the future. And we get ideas and thoughts in our heads about our future. And some of them are just really good ideas. But there can be really good ideas. And there can be God ideas. One is orchestrated and, and authorized here in our heads. Maybe in our hearts. And we think it out. We plan it out. We start to lay maybe some groundwork. We think this is what's going to happen. This would be best for me. But those things could be the very things that will steal our today. They steal our energy. They steal our heart. and our, They captivate our imagination and keep us busy. And keep us from following God's idea, His plan. We can, we can even work really hard. Maybe we can get some success. We can even say, look, I've worked really hard and made this happen. Thank, thank God. He, he must have been in this. And maybe God will let that go. I, I don't know. But that's a path that will not be blessed. And it's not the path that God intended. So we have to be very careful. James 4 and 13 says this. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go in such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live. And do this or do that. It's the Lord's will. We want to hone in on what the Lord's will is. And let that be the thing that separates us and sets us on freedom. That going in God's direction, knowing his will and following him out. Knows that it, it's it's a, a thought. I want to say it like this. Andy Stanley wrote this book. And, and he said, um, it's called The Principle of the Path. And he says, you can intend, you can say, I'm going to go this way. And you can say that all day. But he said, if, you're, if you step this way, it doesn't matter how much you intend to go this way. You are not going to get to where you're supposed to go. That's why we need to hone in on what God's plan is. Because if God says, you're going this way, and you'll listen to him, and you follow him, you're going to get right to where he's taking you. Be reminded that he has a plan that is blessed. And it, he is going to take you through so I've been thinking about this, and I, I've been uh, planning on it, thinking about it, praying about it for, for days. And, and I thought about this plan that the enemy has for distraction. He wants us to miss out on the time that we're supposed to have, the purposes we're supposed to have in God. He wants us to get all off track. We have right now, and he is right here right now, and that means there's a purpose to right now. We don't have to be distracted by what is to happen, what has happened, or what may come. We can be on purpose right here and now. I can tell Jesus showed up in my life the day that I got saved, and it was right on time. He is there, and he is here with me now. But God is still God. Since we're all still, still here, what does he want us to do? So I ask myself, how do I, get, how do I make today matter? 
How do I make today count? How do I know that I'm on purpose right here today? And the Lord instantly took me to my devotion time. And I can tell you a bunch over the years when I've gotten done with my my devotion time, I just got up and I felt in my heart, man, I need to call them. I need to talk to them. I could look at somebody. I don't even have to know them. But all of a sudden, I feel compassion for them. And I feel like for a moment that I see them like God sees them. And I feel like he, he feels about them. I get this, all of a sudden I get this sense and this purpose of, man, okay, I'm here on purpose. And, and I know what I'm supposed to do. And he showed me that those things happen when we put God first. Every day when we spend time with him, a, a lot of people do it in the morning and that makes perfect sense. They put God in the right, put themselves in the right place under the hand of God in, in subjection to God and say, God, I love you and here I am. And spend this beautiful time in fellowship with him. Then it's like we come out and we see the world through him. That's how we make today matter is our time with him. Our time when we get in our Bible, our time when we have devotion and make connection with him. That makes the day come alive. We don't just think about, man, I can't wait till Saturday comes, you know. I can't wait till Sunday, man, we're going to have awesome church. Praise God we are. But what about today? God is still God today. He's, he's God on Tuesday afternoon. He's God late on Thursday night. He's God when I was at the Derby at 3 o'clock in the morning last night. He was God there. He's God. He can take care of us and watch out for us. He's so incredible and so amazing. I looked this up, and, and uh, Paul writes in Philippians, and he says this. Philippians 3 and 8, he says this. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but a loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, I do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith, through the faith of Christ, of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but I do this one thing, forgetting those things which are behind me. I'm reaching forward to those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was talking about a pursuit that they had that it was on purpose. If you read the story, he considers it like a race. He's talking about doing the very best he can, not not today and then maybe a couple weeks from now. He was talking, he said, I'm going to do the very best that I can today. I'm going to do the very best that I can do today. Then he went to bed and he woke up the next day. He said, I'm going to do the very best that I can today. I'm not going to let a day go by. I'm not going to sit and waste time and wonder what could happen and look for the finish line and just <laughs> till it comes. He said, I'm going to press. I'm going to press. And he even talks about forgetting the things that are behind, which is beautiful because he's saying that and he's not saying it like I don't care if it was good I don't care who God was back then forget that stuff no he's not saying that he's saying I am not going to be content on where I've come from I'm not going to be content to just remember the old days and the good times that we had when God is so great and so real I'm going to draw on him right now I'm going to experience him today I'm going to apprehend him because he's grabbing a hold of me I'm going to grab a hold of him every day there was a purpose Paul talks of running the race. You can see that each day he was striving to be at his best. He, was, he has a purpose of knowing God and doing everything he is supposed to do in this life. So how do you become present in the day? You put God first. Matthew 6 and 33 says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You put him first. Put him first in your every day. And watch, watch the day take a different turn. Watch your investment in Him show up in a blessing in your life. Show up in a touch in your life. Show up and, 
and you begin to know what to do and where you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be there on purpose every day. What happens? What happens? We can be the witness, the right word at the right time. We can be alert to see maybe God like we never had before. Maybe even important relationships can become alive again because you're in the moment. You're being who you're supposed to be. If you would stand, I want to share this last story with you. And then we're going to pray. I share this story just to as an example, and it's marriage. Most, most people, the most important times in your marriage, in anybody's marriage, are dating, getting married, maybe having kids. And if you experienced it or, or may, you know, you're going to get there someday, that separation of death. You know, I've never seen anybody that uh, that that disvalued, if that even is a word, maybe it's not. Somebody that disvalued those moments of last breath of somebody that you love for and you care for. I I haven't heard of too many husbands and wives that were just like, eh, I won't go, and you know. But to be there in those moments, they wouldn't do anything to to miss those moments. And I will say. It's, it's ironic that where people are most present are where they can go back to and say, this is what mattered most. But I want to tell you this. Check this out. Why don't we, you know, some people in, in you get in a certain place in your marriage, they're like, well, they're not who they used to be. Well, are you present? Are you present in that moment with that person? Or are you distracted? Is life too busy? Eh, the, the, the excitement of it's wore off. Ah, I would suggest this. If you can be present with them in the moment, no distractions, you're going to find that you're going to make memories where you can connect with them and be close to them. And it's not just the beginning and it's not just the end, but maybe in the middle matters. I want us to be present today. Be who God intends us to be today. And not wait for some other time or, or not say, man, I remember when. But us for to be His, touched by Him, experiencing Him. He's God. He doesn't have to wait on a day. He doesn't have to wait on a time or a place. If we'll get in His presence, we can have fellowship with Him. And He can use us to touch the world. That way He can move and work through us. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We look through scripture and it talks about, you know, we're not necessarily promised tomorrow, but we have right now. God has gifted you with today. That's incredible. He has gifted you with today. Yesterday could have been it, but you have today. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He paid a price for this day, for this time, for us to be able to make a decision to say, God, I admit I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and you sent your son to die on the cross for me. I accept that today, right now. Today is the day of salvation. I accept that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would like to, to pray a prayer today that would ask Jesus into your heart, ask him to save you, Ask Him into your heart. You have the opportunity to do that right now. Every one of us are sinners, but for the grace of God through Jesus Christ. If you would like to pray a prayer that would turn your life around right now, today, and you would live, be able to live the rest of your life with a promise of eternity, I would ask you real quick to raise your hand and say, you know what, I, I want in on that prayer. I want in on that. I want to pray that. You feel a touch in your heart. You feel a conviction that, man, something's wrong and you need to make a decision to make things right. Is that you? Is there anybody here in the house? We have one. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? You've, you've got this time. you got this moment. It's beautiful. 
Okay, we're going to pray. We're going to pray with one person. We're all going to pray this together. And if you mean it from your heart, all you have to do is mean it. Be serious. God's going to save your life. Please repeat this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And God, you sent a Savior. Your Son, Jesus, died on the cross for me and rose from the grave for me. I give you my heart and I give you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate. Amen. And what I want to do is there's a couple different things working here. Number one is we talked about a lot of distractions. We talked about stuff that maybe, maybe hit on some nerves with people. I don't know. Maybe not. I want to give you an opportunity to find a place in the altar to pray, but also... I want to talk to another group of people. If you have a need in your life, I want you to come down. You can pray here, find a place in the altar, or the pastors and ministers can pray with you. If he's the God of today, I believe that he can touch you today. The need that you brought into the house tonight, I believe that he can touch and move on that. And I wouldn't be so goofy as to not give you that opportunity. I believe that he wants to do something. We have this time, we have this moment, we have today, so I believe that he wants to do something great. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, if you want to come down, we want to meet you in the altar. We're going to turn the music up for a moment. We want to give you the opportunity to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and praise you. God, we appreciate the gift of today. Lord, it's what you've given us. God, it's an opportunity for us to have fellowship with you. It's an opportunity for us to be on purpose. So, Lord, we push away all the distractions, maybe things of the past, maybe guilt that's been on top of us that the enemy keeps reminding us of. God, you've already taken care of that. You've already wiped that slate clean. So, Lord, we release that to you. And, God, we trust you with that thing. We trust what you say about us, not even necessarily what we say about ourselves, but we trust you with that. God, we appreciate our heritage and where we've come from. But, Lord, we're not going to settle for just yesterday being yesterday, but we're going to give you all that we are. We want to see you again, the beautiful God that you are today. Lord, we pray over our futures. Lord, we're not going to walk in fear, but we're going to walk in trust and faith. God, because your word says that you're going to lead us through all things. And, Lord, we know that you have a plan for us. So I pray that you move on hearts and lives and move on folks tonight. Lord, touch and minister to their needs and speak to them where they are. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open
Friday. Well, it's been good to be in God's house, amen. Amen, amen. To me, if you step back, if you've been feeling and seeing what's been happening at our church, you know that God's up to something. There's a purpose for all this. And I feel like if we're going to be, in, you know, we're talking about a, a campaign to financially be involved, you know, we've got something in this, so to speak. You know, we're investing. I believe that just like that, I believe that God's wanting every one of us to step up and he's wanting to, to turn us over and start using us, be agents of God, be, be workers for him. In every situation that we're around, we're in an exciting time, we're in the end times, and it's a time for us to look and see because the, the, the field is ripe. So it's time for us to look. It's an exciting time for us to be together. It's an exciting time for us to be at our church. Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, one more time, we just thank you and praise you for being with us tonight. God, to your glory.